back to another video. I'm your host, Ellen Camera Guy, and in this episode, I give you a little mini review of the 5D Mark IV. Let's jump into it. So I had the chance to do a couple of event shoots. Uh, actually, the first one was I got the camera Friday evening for a football game. My goal was to shoot some Friday night football with the 5D Mark IV. I wanted it the day before on Thursday, but it didn't come in. But I got it on Friday, and as soon as I got it, I went and started shooting uh, some high school football. And high school football, I think, is probably one of the most challenging situations you can find yourself shooting because of low light, auto-focusing challenges, and you really need good glass in order to get some really good, uh, compelling images. And so the 5D Mark IV, I feel, kind of sits right in that place, considering the fact that they've added an additional frame per second on here, improved the auto-focusing, slightly better ISO, and additional features on here that will make things run smoother for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and detail some main points and I took some notes about what I noticed about the 5D Mark IV. This is just my initial review. It's not a final or conclusive review because it's ongoing. I'd have to still test this camera out for a little longer in order to give you a better idea if this is the right camera for you. For those of you who are brand new to my channel, this is not a paid review of any kind of any sort, I paid for the camera myself out of my own pocket to review the actual the actual camera. So let's go ahead and jump into my six points about the camera. Let's go over number one. If you take a look at the 5D Mark III compared to the 5D Mark IV, and you've seen pictures of it, the two bodies look almost identical in structure, design, and placement of literally all the buttons with the exception of one that appeared right next to the, the wheel on the back of the camera, which allows you to customize it. And, and I think that's what's really nice about this camera is the layout, the buttons, and the customizations, and I really like that. Now you can kind of set your, um, so what I've done specifically is I have my, my front button up here. What is this, the depth of field preview button, I believe. My depth of field preview button, you know what it does? It changes from AI servo to one shot mode which is pretty sick. I have my set button set up so if I press it, I can change my ISO. And then I have this little button here that they added to navigate through my autofocus mode. So when I got the camera for the football game, I didn't have to spend 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes trying to learn a new camera. I already know the 5D Mark III and the 5D Mark IV was like very, very similar. Oh, all right, so number two. Let's talk about megapixels. The 5D Mark III had 21, 22 or so megapixels, and now with the 5D Mark IV, we're at 30. It's still gonna take some time to really kind of see the big benefit and, uh, and importance of it, but we can at least say more megapixels, you're gonna get a little bit more detail, your prints are gonna look nicer if you print, you know, the same size print, smaller prints are gonna look nicer. Um, you can obviously downscale and get an improved quality. So that 30 megapixel jump is really nice and I can kind of tell from the images. When you try, again, I don't want to make comparisons, but when you have the A7R2 or the D810 at 36 and this at 42, uh, you kind of you get used to just kind of zooming into an image. And so Canon, Canon really bumped up those megapixels for their photographers to help keep them up to date with those higher megapixels. And obviously everyone has their own opinions and thoughts about megapixels, but that little bump is really nice for the photography component. Number, so number three is autofocus. The 5D Mark IV and the 5D Mark III have pretty much similar setup for autofocusing. And from what I understand, the 5D Mark, the 5D Mark IV has a similar autofocusing system to the 1DX Mark II. And it is a little bit taller, right? It is a little bit taller, it's not wider. It's the same in terms of just the coverage here, but in terms of height, there's a little bit more coverage. I know there's a lot of comparisons made to the Nikon D500 where, oh, well, the D500 has a spread that covers the entire screen. I mean, in, in some cases, it's actually really helpful to have that, but with this particular camera, I, I never really find an issue just having the, the autofocusing points that I have already set up. So I just kind of work around the points that are available to me. I do not have a scientific test of this at this time. So this is more about my opinion and uh, what I experienced out there. But in terms of autofocusing performance, and I was using the Sigma 120-300 Sport, I found the autofocus performance to be noticeably better in terms of like catching and, and acquiring focus and holding and locking focus. And hopefully you can see that in examples in this video. I was really trying to 
hone in on a, an individual and ran that shutter. And I actually, you know, I ran, I ran the shutter button down because I was trying to test it out. Um, and, and I found out that the buffer was just enough for whatever you needed to do. Honestly, if you have a, uh, if you have a pretty fast card, or have a 256 gigabyte Extreme Pro card, if you just let go of the shutter button, it'll clear your buffer pretty quick, as long as you have a fast CF card. And then you can fire again. So the buffer isn't like, you know, super detrimental. I know it's not a deep buffer like you'll find on a D500 or a 1D series camera, but I think Canon, you know, Canon just gave us eh, enough, right? It's good enough. So number four, Canon updated and increased the screen resolution on the 5D Mark IV. It looks much better. You can see the details better on your photos and it's just a really nice addition you're gonna love that little bump in resolution the other nice thing about the screen is that it's touchscreen now I never thought I'd be doing this much but um, I do find myself you know scrolling through the images and pinching and zooming to check focus once in a while it's gonna come in handy and I think if you've never really used it um, you're gonna find yourself using it at some point and you're gonna say like this is nice I do appreciate this number five NFC. Now it was about time that Canon actually did this and I really like this feature on the Sony cameras and I know Canon did this on the ADD but I really like it. All you gotta do is download a Canon app onto your Android phone and make sure you have NFC ability and then I think you have to have it activated in the camera. You just match it up, tap it while you have this in playback and then the photo transfers over. And once you kind of create that connection you can transfer whatever photos of your choice. And that's a really nice feature. I was trying to use it. I didn't have it set up properly, so I didn't use it at the football game. But there's times when I take pictures and I want to share it quickly, and I just can't. The last one I'm going to talk about is number six on my points is high ISO. This one's going to be subjective because it's going to require a little bit more testing. This is just my initial review. But just looking at the files that I have, and I'm showing some examples to you. I have files that are from 12,800 all the way to 25,600. As long as I nailed focus, it to me personally, I was okay with it. Even at 25,600 or 20,000, if the image looked sharp, the grain did not bother me one bit because I mean it's like a sports image anyway. And with that, I could easily post that up online. I could do small prints, whatever it happens to be, and it's gonna look really good. And so I am really happy with the advancement in the ISO performance. I don't know what number to give it. It could be a one third, two thirds, maybe a stop of an improvement in ISO performance. We don't really know. I will say that the grain structure and the noise looks really clean and high ISO photos don't really scare me as much. So I am very, very happy about that. Let's talk about the crop factor now. If you're trying to shoot something that's far away, a really great thing is that with the 70 to 200 and the crop factor, you're gonna get an effectively a longer telephoto lens for you to record. And I noticed this a lot at the Rose Parade where I wanted to get some good close-up recordings of the actual people going down on their floats. And so having that crop factor at 1.74 actually cropped in a lot more and I got some really tight crops recorded in 4K, which was really nice. So there is some benefit with the crop factor. Now what can we do about the wide angle side of things? You have a 1.74 crop factor. What I recommend you do is go ahead and find some APS-C glass. You can look at Sigma. Uh, they have the 18 to 35. They have um, the 1750-2A, which I have, I have attached here onto this. And I did the calculation right now. And since this goes to, it's a 2.8 lens, the 17 millimeters basically becomes 30 millimeters. Now it's not super wide, okay? So there's just some things you're gonna have to give up on, but at least it's still around the 35, 30 millimeter range, which is not a bad deal. So in this case, you might find yourself shooting with a lens like this. And by the way, these aren't very, they're not super expensive. You can find them for around $300 or so on eBay. So it's a really nice lens to grab, especially if you want that wider lens, wider range. And then also your zoom lens will help you. So there is some ways to combat the wide angle problem. So if you're trying to get even wider, consider I think the Tokina 11 to 16 or something like that. I don't remember the lens exactly, but I think at 11 millimeters, uh, 11 times 1.74 is roughly 20, 19 or 20 millimeters. So you definitely can work around the crop factor challenge if you want to, 
okay? It's very doable. If this is the camera that you wanna use for cinema work or whatever, it is definitely doable. You just have to be a little bit more creative. Folks, that's all I have for you in this video. I really hope it was helpful to you. This was an initial review uh, about my experience and, and how I've used it so far these past two days and shooting for, I don't know, like at least five hours or so of shooting. It is a nice camera. It is a good camera. Um, I don't know at the end of the day if it's worth the $3,500 price tag. If you're a professional, right? If you're a professional and you just kind of write these things off, like you shoot weddings, events all the time, you're making plenty of money, then if it's gonna be a write-off, upgrade. You know, upgrade your camera to the 5D Mark IV. If you're kind of in the prosumer, semi-pro market, don't upgrade. Um, or wait till the price drops. That's my recommendation if you plan on staying with the Canon system. Just wait a little bit longer, let that price drop down a little bit, and then snag the camera. I just don't think it's worth the $3,500 price tag at this very moment. That's all I got for you guys. If you did find this video helpful, please consider giving it a like. If you like the videos I am producing and you wanna see more videos about the 5D Mark IV upcoming, consider subscribing. And with that said, I'm your host, Elman Camera Guy, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.